Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways Podcast Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, Blood Moon Rising. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Rena, and our coterie has some very interesting adventures in store after last time, I think. But uh, before we can get to that, we need some introductions. So, to my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I play Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja, and I am just getting started. Oh my. And to Marcus is right. Hi, my name is Tegan, and I'm playing Rom the Shaman. And I am going to go do some tongue research. Yes, you've already done a bit of that tonight, and you've proven quite good at it. So we'll see how the rest of the evening goes. I've been told that. And at the end of the table? Hi, this is Ali, and I play Katerina Bogdanovich. And I'm pretty sure things are about to get interesting. More so than they already were. So we are still missing Vince Markovich, our young Tremere. So last but not least, we have... This is Tiffany, and I play Alex Giovanni, and the ghost thinks he has the upper hand. For now. We'll see how that goes. So when last we left them, Katerina and Marcus were developing their relationship a little bit further. So let's begin with Alex and Rom as they are going back to Alex's apartment to do some research. So it is after midnight now for the two of you. It is the morning, well, wee morning hours of November 1st, still technically Halloween night. And you have arrived back at Alex's apartment to do some tongue research, as Rom so eloquently put it. Yes. Well, I'd probably change and um, take a shower and put on my silk jammies and then tuck into some research. Did I get any hunger back from that? You're down to three. I am down to three. Yes, you did take the edge off. You're still hungry, though. I am not going to take a shower. And I'm going to continue to wear my toga kilt. All right. So we have Alex in their silk pajamas and Rom in their slightly mussed up, perhaps slightly stained toga kilt. It just looks like I just you've taken a hotel bed sheet and just wrapped around the waist. So what is the plan for the rest of tonight then? I'm going to go through all my books and see what I have, if there's any leads on who I should talk to, what clan maybe, or um, what I can do. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I just want to see if I have anything here. If I don't, uh, I may go see if grandmother's still in town and see if she will allow me to find books there. All right, so you're going through your personal books for the clan and your own research that you've done. So I'd like you to give me a roll. Uh, I would like hmm, investigation or occult, whichever is higher for you, plus intelligence. See what you find. I am a generous god. For now. Yes, for now. It's a four? Four? All right. So with four successes, it takes you a little bit as you are going through all of your almost 200 years worth of 
accumulated knowledge. But you do find some things. Uh, You find some very interesting rites that you have related to communicating with or possibly dispelling wraiths. You forgot you had that. That was one of your early, early pieces of lore. But in a very old notebook, library, it's, it's a notebook you almost forgot you had. There's some notes on an esoteric rite called Restore Essence. And you've never used this particular rite before. And it's a little hard to read some of the handwriting. You don't even remember who you got this from. You think it was one of your pilgrimages through Europe at some point. But you think that with a little bit of tweaking, you could maybe rechannel this right. It's originally supposed to restore a spirit as a whole. So a spirit that's been damaged or broken in some way beyond the veil, you think maybe you can channel it to restore parts of an essence. It'll take you a little bit of time to figure out what you need to do with it in order to make it work for Luther's situation, because he doesn't, he obviously doesn't need completely restoring. But you you think you can figure it out if you just spend a few hours with it. Yeah, I'll do that. And then while we still have some time, if there are items that I need, I may send Rom out shopping. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. You said you do what you're told. I will. I, I, touche. Do you happen to have anything? I don't know if you have like a lend lease agreement here, but uh, do you have anything on, uh, kind philosophy and or religious practices I don't know can I roll for it you can go look (laughs) I think that would be an Alex roll not a Rom roll to see what Alex has in their library Uh, do you want me to roll the same thing again just roll a d10 this is kind of like a, a luck roll to see if you have a couple things that Rom would be interested in nope big negative. It's a two. Okay, so Rom, you spend a little time looking around the library while Alex is researching this rite that they want to do and you don't find anything that you can remotely understand. Well, darn it. Alright, what's the what's the shopping list? Um, With this particular ritual in its original form, you're going to need fresh human blood one whole body's worth because you're essentially taking the essence of that person and transferring it to another spirit essentially is what you're doing so it does require that kind of life sacrifice that particular essence Uh, you are also going to need one of Luther's fetters which you already have you are going to need a rose with the thorns still attached, preferably red, but you think you could make another color work if you had to. And you are also going to need some time. This is not a an easy right to cast because it is transferring the essence from one living being to a being in the shadow world, essentially. And Alex, you're also going to need a very, very sharp knife for this particular modification. I probably have something like that around, or I can sharpen one of mine. Absolutely. Because uh, as, as as you're reading it, you're going to need to, you think with your modifications, what you're going to need to do is you are going to need to remove the part that you are attempting to restore in the spirit world from a living being, and then you're going to need their blood after for the rest of the rite. Yeah, I was going to just tell Rom to bring somebody here. Just somebody. Just anybody. It's it's Halloween. Uh-huh. 
Well, I mean, couldn't it be someone that maybe was on Luther's shit list or something? I mean, I guess that would all be... They would be vampires. Well, you know. Just get someone. I have a soundproof room. It's fine. I know. I just want to point out that you criticized me for attempted murder earlier. And now simply a mere... Those were not my herd. Those were somebody else's. And if you wanted to find out who they belong to, I mean, you could have, but then you probably would have ended up dead. No, of course. I just... Okay, fine. So, um, is this... So it's, this is not, like, time the herb. Like, I'm not making a stop at, like, Walmart. No, right? I need okay. time, like, time as in time to cast. Okay, so you need a person... I assume you have a knife. Yep. You just and need you... to get a person and um, red roses with thorns. I've got that in my garden at home. Okay. You can have one of my roses. Aw. I'm sure Luther will be so appreciative. Anyways. All right. I'm going to go ahead and head out into the night. So Rom goes off on his little shopping trip. And I will... Is Luther here? Well, are you specifically looking for him now? Yeah. Okay. Where do you keep his hat? Oh, it's probably hanging on a hook, like on a coat hook in the living room. Like, you know, common area. So as soon as you have the thought, is Luther here? You look up towards the hat and you see his sort of spectral form coming through your wall and just sort of standing next to the the hat rack. It's not as physically strong here as it was at the temple. Right. Because the the temple has an it is built on a place that's even thinner when it comes to the veil. So he's right. still recognizable, still fairly present, but he's he's a little bit fainter and the outlines aren't as sharp as they were at the temple. I'm just going to look over to him and tell him we're going to get things um, sorted. Do I think that we can do that tonight or we're going to have to wait till tomorrow? If Rom gets back in a decent amount of time, you think you could do it tonight and have it completed before the night ends? Because with your occult knowledge, you would know that Halloween night leading into All All Saints Day is going to be your best possible casting time for a rite of this nature. Right. Okay. So uh, I will text Rom to uh, move their ass and uh, try and get things set up uh, while they are gone. I will also send uh, a text to Marcus that says have a bigger lead there is a ritual i know who is casting it because if he's at if he's at a party if you can ignore a text is is alex's you know thought yeah so marcus gets a text alert but i'm not sure he really notices all that much uh what is marcus doing at the moment actually he's definitely ignoring his phone (laughs) at least for the moment at least for the moment what is he doing god so many things I would say, given where we left off last session, last time we saw Marcus and Katarina together, Marcus is probably a little distracted from his phone at the moment. He's trying to get the trying to get the the, the tension set just right, uh, and so he has probably availed himself of her uh, now empty wine glass and has returned it to the coffee table and uh, is admiring and um, paying very special attention to Katerina's wrists. Uh, There's even in vampiric senses there are still places that uh, the blood flows rather strong and as a um, uh, a hunter of sorts. He's the type of person that wants to get very close to those specific veins. And so that's probably where 
he first kisses her is the wrist. He probably moves his way up fairly slowly after that. Uh, finds her shoulder. And he also wants to give her enough space and time to react to what's happening. He's not necessarily interested in bowling her over, especially given the um, discussion of her familiarity with such situations earlier. It's important to let your partner breathe, even if they're undead. And how is Katerina responding? Why would I respond? That's that's nonsense. Yeah, I suppose if, if I get any sort of pause from her, right? If I don't see that the... The, the dance is willing to at yet this point be a one that involves both of us directly, uh, then I have no problem taking the lead in that situation. And I'd probably go from there to, given my natural vampiric strength, um, hoisting her from the couch and standing up and, and sort of making sure that her dress doesn't tip the bottle or or the glasses over as it kind of dangles from my fingertips. And I will simply move inexorably towards the bedroom where we can be a little less exposed here than in the, than in the uh, upper conference area, this sitting space. And with a uh, relatively swift kick to the door to close it for privacy, we will adjourn to a comfortable spot where I can hold her wrists and make sure she can't go anywhere. I don't think that Marcus would want to leave anything to chances. He wouldn't want to risk rousing his own blood for discipline use because he doesn't believe it's necessary at this point. So I think he would get to know her um, in very tactile ways. He's strong enough to probably keep her where he needs her given his um, Bruja blood but he's very interested to see how she's put together he's seen um, obviously her in the flesh but out of the dress I'm sure it's something quite to behold she is a Toreador yes and I think that the text probably goes unanswered because uh, he's likely a little, a little bit engaged at that point so Alex, you don't get a reply for a while. That's fine. I have other things to do. Uh, he can talk to me tomorrow um, night. Uh, I just, because I figured he's probably at a party or, you know, doing whatever Bruja do. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess uh, also while Ram is out, I will probably talk to the rest of my herd and just see if there's anything new on the gossip lines and then uh, and then check in with my little birds make sure they've been doing their job and then yeah hopefully Ram will be back soon Eddie texts you that the police and the coroner have cleared out Maxine's apartment but that there's still caution tape over the door and He's, his text message says, got autopsy report. Fucking weird. I'm going to ask him to send it to me. You just get a thumbs up emoji. And a few minutes later, you get an uh, alert from your email. I'm going to take a look at it. All right. So you pull up your very highly encrypted email account that you don't use super often because you're technically not supposed to, but... Eddie helped me out, I'm sure. Oh, he did. He, he's very helpful that way. And you scan through the preliminary coroner's report on Maxine. And the report notes that there were very strong traces of something like heroin in her, what was left of her insides. And... The note also says that this appears to be a, a new brand because they've never seen a drug destroy someone's insides this way. And the report notes that 
pretty much none of her intestines or internal organs were left. It was like they had liquefied okay. inside her body. And that the stages, the stage of decomposition she was found in is something you would expect from a corpse that had been left in the woods for three or four days. Not something you'd find on an apartment couch, only dead for 36 hours by the time he got to it. Okay. I guess that's not, for me, it's not too or- out of the ordinary. It's kind of expected. I mean, some things are a little concerning. So that's what you occupy yourself with for a little bit. Rom, you're out shopping. I am out shopping. Uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, I think I'm going to try to obtain... Let's see, I had... I had some... No, not... Let me check my Google shopping list here. Um, uh human blood and no, no, they already had the knife. Uh, Oh yeah, the rose. Okay. So I will swing by my place first and I have a lovely set of rose bushes out front that are very thorny and most of them are peaches. There's a couple yellows, but I definitely have a rose bush that has um, that that is red, a nice deep red, almost uh, uh, burgeoning on on purple. So I'll go ahead and and snip a nice long stem off of one of those. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna head to the frat row of one of San Francisco's possibly prestigious universities. Which one's going to have a good frat row? There is a private university, the University of San Francisco, which is a Jesuit university. So it's theoretically the good kids, but we, well, we, all, we all know. know what happens when they're supposed to be the good kids and then they get away from mommy and daddy for just a little while. So I think we're going to go ahead to... Uh, is, does that school have some fraternities? Do they have a frat row? Okay, then we're going to go over there because I am dressed, if you remember, in a toga. And it is Halloween night. So we're going to go find, um, we're going to go find some, uh, we're going to go find someone with not enough brain cells. All right. So you head down towards uh, Golden Gate Park. Uh, The campus of the university is between the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge and Golden Gate Park. And there's a bunch of the, what we would call fraternities, their, their houses are down there. So there is a whole row for the fraternities and you have, you have some knowledge of the fact uh, that Pi Delta Theta tends to be the party animals. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure that with my top knot, I definitely look like a assistant professor at this point in California. An assistant professor with shark bites on his abdomen and a toga. That's because I study marine biology. Fantastic. All right. Um, I am looking for somebody off on their own. I'm looking for somebody inebriated and inebriated enough that their friends maybe ditched them. Okay, give me a luck roll. All right, I have rolled a eight. All right, so with an eight, yes, you definitely, you prowl around for a few minutes and no one really takes any notice of you because there's a bunch of drunken frat boys in various costumes and there's some sorority sisters following them around. And a couple of them are wearing some very interesting Halloween costumes for this uh, private religious university. But you come across one young man who's collapsed against a couple bushes in between two houses, both of which have the lights out, because it is about about two o'clock in the morning for you by the time you you find him. And... uh, He's dressed like Jesus, 
with a long wig and a full beard, a long white robe. He's got a little wooden cross on the on the ground next to him that he's vomited over. And he's just looking up at you, blinking. Hey man, I know you. I'm the son of God. And he makes the sign of the cross over you. And I'm Pontius Pilate. Fantastic. So, hey, man, you need some help getting back to your place? He looks around, bleary-eyed. Uh, in my father's house are many mansions, and I don't know which one's mine. Hey, no, I see, uh, and I'm going to look and see, is he carrying his wallet on him or anything? Not in this outfit, no. Personally identifying information off of him. Um, hey, let me help you get back. All right, man, I got you. Don't worry about a thing, all right? Hey, be careful. I saw some of some of the RAs down that way, and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm helping you out. I don't want you to get caught enough, all right? So I got a, I got an Uber here around the block, and we'll get you back, all right? It's gonna be easy. Got it. Probably shouldn't spend so much time turning water into wine, if you know what I mean. You know what? Strangely enough, I do. Um, you know, transmutation's kind of my thing as well. All right. So, I, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get. Him. We're just two. We're just two frat dudes in an Uber. We're we're gonna go to. We're gonna we're gonna go to within a block of Alex's place, but not Alex's place. I'm learning. Good job. Alex must be so proud of you. The audience can't see the thumbs ups. And then um, I'll walk him the rest of the way to Alex's place, carry him if need be. And uh, if I get a chance, I, when I walk into Alex's place, I think I, I'm going to say, I present to you the second coming. So we'll leave the two of you with your right aid. And we will go over and see how Marcus and Katarina are getting on. I think that while the wrist of our fair Toreador is one thing, and perhaps the pleasant running of hands over legs and up thighs is, is another, I think Marcus really needs to ensure that there is something there other than the animalistic pleasure he's seeking and to do so he uh, is going to find her lips um, the uh, the intent is to use them for pleasure rather than simply using them to feed which is what we normally use them he'll taste her that way there's an immediate response to that it's while I'm not super accustomed to it because I never experienced it before, it's a lot more the language that makes sense to me. And despite being kind of nervous as all hell, there's a response and my hands will reach up and seek Marcus's shirt and with trembling and unsure hands try to unbutton his shirt to get to his chest. Okay, so more than happy to play along with the um, undressing portion of the show. I think Marcus is slowly kind of dialing in and calculating what what response is he's getting. And so he'll just stay right there and continue to kiss her. And of course, I'm going to shed clothes because if they're getting unbuttoned, then there's no reason to have them on anymore. Yeah, I'm just going to watch that. Yeah, you know, uh, several decades working on um, the uh, San Francisco docks has left uh, the physique of one Marcus Voss in fairly well-conditioned 
state. He's um, absent of any um, tattoos that you can see. I don't imagine him completely tan, but perhaps slightly. And uh, he'll stand there at the edge of the bed and just slowly let the dress shirt drop onto the floor. And then probably very purposefully lean back onto the bed and um, find a space that he could make his own home there and go back to uh, enjoying Katarina's mouth. Yeah, getting lost in that kiss will make me significantly more comfortable with the situation. And who knows what the rest of the night brings then? Who knows indeed. But uh, they're going to have a very enjoyable rest of the night, I think. Maybe. So while they're having some fun, and perhaps breaking some furniture, Alex and Rom are having a little less fun, perhaps, with their drunken frat boy. Speak for yourself. We get to kill the son of God. Uh, yeah, I will escort him into the room and tell him that I have his cross ready for him. And then, uh, yeah, I will uh, chain him up and so that he can't struggle. And then, uh, yeah, first things first, I'll have to, uh, you know, pry his mouth open and take his tongue out. All right, so you drag him into your special room, and is this Rom's first time seeing Alex's playroom? Yeah. Please describe it to me in detail. Okay. So all of the walls are, like, uh, a blood red, like that deep, like, burgundy red. Like, if you had thrown blood on the wall and it dried for a few days. Not quite brown, but, you know. Uh, there are... There's uh, swings uh, from the ceiling. There are chains in various locations. There are crosses for people to be chained to or strapped to. Um, there is a table as a, like, stretching, you know, quartering table. There is... Uh, various outfits set up on mannequins for any gender or no gender. Yeah. Pretty much, you know, uh, a masochist dream in here. I have to say, Alex, this must be quite an investment of tools and infrastructure you have built up here. Well, I mean... When you want to play, you want a safe place to do it. I, I see that you... These are really nice uh, drainage vents, by the way, in the tile. I really appreciate that. Well, you have to spray it down somehow. Um, Hey, you mind getting the door so that we can soundproof this? Yeah, and I'll go ahead and just shut the door. All right, so you close the door, and the frat boy who is chained up to the cross just sort of looks around... He's starting to look a little less drunk now that he's in this very unfamiliar situation. Uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Fuck are you? What? Why am I here? He starts tugging with his wrists, trying to trying to get away, and obviously can't. Well, you said you were the son of God, so I'm a costume man. Whatever you are. Whatever makes you comfortable. Anyways, and I'll move forward and I'll just like pry his jaw open and uh, try and yank his tongue out. He starts ineffect ineffectually struggling once you grab his jaw and his eyes go wide and he sees something in your eyes and he sees perhaps the hint of Fang as you lean in very close. And he mutters something that sounds to you like, holy shit, it's real. It's real. And 
he hurriedly starts muttering, Our Father who art in heaven. And, but he can't quite get the words out because you're holding his jaw open and he is so drunk and so scared and there's the smell of urine in the air as he pisses himself out of fear. But no one else can hear him outside this room. And you hold up the knife and you cut his tongue out and he screams and blood spurts across his chest, his face, in the air. And he's just almost soundlessly screaming in pain as you hold his bloody tongue. I'm going to kick the five-gallon bucket that I probably had sitting, you know, ready underneath him so we can catch some of that. And hopefully not scare Rom with how much I enjoy this. And uh, then we will... uh, I will tip the cross forward so that I can cut his throat and bleed him out. So you tip the cross forward and you make your preparations. Uh, You know that before you bleed him, you need to draw some symbols on the floor. Right. And so he's just sort of hanging there, the, the blood out of his mouth dribbling into this bucket. And he's almost on the point of passing out from pain and fear and terror but he can't take his eyes off you as you methodically begin drawing out some symbols in a circle on the floor. You put Luther's hat in the center to summon him, and you begin drawing these occult symbols around it. Rom, you're hungry. I am. I'm also, I also still have a rose. You do have the rose. You're holding it because it's not time for that yet. But... You're hungry, and there's fresh blood in the air, and a terrified, screaming human. So I take it I need to make a frenzy check? You do. Minus three for your hunger. That's four successes out of six. You like that? Yes. So you manage to resist, barely, but your hands are shaking, and the thorns pierce your fingers. As your nostrils flare at Alex, you might see that Rom is struggling to keep himself under control. He backs into a a fairly safe corner against a bench and just stands there, gripping this rose tightly and looking at you and very, very obviously not looking at the soon-to-be corpse on the wall. I will give Rom an intimidating look that is akin to, if you fuck this up, I will eat you. No, no, we're 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 good. I'm just gonna close my eyes. I'm like, I'm not gonna. Oh yeah, we're not gonna. You got this, Alex. I won't. Um. Yep, you're good. So, Alex, you place Luther's hat in the center of this circle with these symbols, and. According to your ritual, you stand in the center and you call his name three times. And he slowly manifests inside this room in the center of the circle next to the hat. And his spirit is looking around, a little confused, perhaps a little in respect at the room. And he looks at you and he sees this bloody tongue that you're holding. And one eyebrow, ghostly eyebrow, goes up and he nods slowly. And Rom, it is time for you to bring the rose. You've got this terrified mortal who's still bleeding into the bucket, barely conscious. But uh, Alex, you take the rose with the thorn still attached, and you lay it across the fetter that is Luther's hat. And then you crush with your foot, the flower into his hat. And the presence of Luther flickers a little bit, but then it looks stronger, slightly. And some of the blood from this tongue drips down onto that meshed hat and rose. The thorns pierce through the hat, the blood drips down onto it, and you can feel Luther getting 
stronger. His outline is more like what you saw in the temple. You're pulling apart the veil here through your through your ritual. And he looks at your mortal sacrifice and he looks at you and he, he nods almost hungrily. You can see his shoulders hunch slightly, even in ghost form, that sort of feral, animalistic, gangrel nature coming to the forefront, even in the spirit realm. And it's time for the blood. We will do that. I will walk over and, uh, yeah, much like uh, the slaughtering of cattle, I will... uh, yeah, cut his throat and have all the blood go into the bucket and then to where it needs to go. In a practiced motion, you slash this young man's throat and he gurgles a little as the blood flows and then he slowly goes limp as he is drained dry. It takes a few minutes, Luther's pacing hungrily back and forth looking at the blood almost as if he can smell it and when this human is completely drained and is nothing but an exsanguinated corpse hanging on your wall you can move this bucket of blood into the center of your circle and as you do Luther who has been pacing in his spectral form He shimmers a little bit, and he dives into this bucket of blood. Almost like an unholy baptism. As he completely submerges his spectral form in the blood. And he disappears somehow, almost as if his essence is compacted. And then begins to stretch out, and you see his head rising up. And you see ghostly blood now dripping off of him as if this blood has been transferred to the spirit realm and he opens his mouth and points to that massive black bloody hole and then he reaches out towards you and points at the bloody tongue in your other hand I will uh, put it where it needs to go you take the tongue and You place it in this spectral form of his mouth, and you shouldn't be able to feel anything there. But because it's Halloween, perhaps, or perhaps perhaps it's the strength of this, this new ritual that you've tried, something connects. And you can feel the tongue sticking. And the blood in the bucket... In, in this center of this this ritual begins to rise up with him and as he's standing up taller the blood rises and drips down him and then it flows out in an explosion of spectral blood all over your room it coats the hat with the crushed rose it coats all of your implements it coats rom it even covers you in your fancy spilt silk pajamas as it just explodes. And then it recedes. It, it seeps into you like, like a spirit. It disappears. It, it's not physically present anymore. But you see Luther cracking his neck in his spectral form, running his new tongue between his teeth and his eyes go wide and he looks at you and he says oh at last and let's change the camera over to Marcus and Katerina now Marcus and Katerina have had uh, an enjoyable few hours Mm. oh yes no absolutely Um, and it's only about 4 a.m. You still have a, f- a few hours before daybreak. Are you lying in bed together? Did you break the bed? Oh, no, we didn't break the bed. The uh, bed's made of stronger stuff than that. 
but uh, I like the idea of us lying in bed together. Perhaps uh, looking out over the bay from the elevated position of the office. And yeah, just relaxing. It's been a very long evening. What with uh, the meeting with Hammer earlier, the Elysium. It's been a full evening. There has been a significant amount of busyness that hasn't been completely related to the problem we're trying to solve and it's a nice break all things considered I'll likely have to get you back to the bakery before the sun of course but I'm glad we had time to spend with one another this evening an extended relaxation period and not even a stitch of business discussed in the last few hours no if there had been I would have walked out. Yes, you made that fairly clear. As you're laying in bed, talking, enjoying the afterglow, Marcus, your phone rings. (sighs) And rings. Fine. I get up. Um, Stalk over to wherever the fuck my clothes have ended up. And I withdraw the phone and see who the hell is calling me. Caller ID says Esmeralda. I hit the button on the phone. Sheriff, how can I help? Marcus, I got him. I need you now. He's cornered. I need help. (laughs) Is this a formal offer, Sheriff? I'm deputizing you, Marcus, if you'll take it. Pier 39. I look back at the bed. The sun's coming up soon, you know. I hadn't expected Katerina to answer that, but... Because, of course, I'm still on the phone. But it's neither here nor there. I turn back to the phone and say, Are you planning on getting him before the sun? If I can. Don't want him getting away, the the motherfucker. All right. That's why I need you. I could take him by myself in one night, but with just a couple hours, I need help. Understood. Pier 39. I'll hang up. I'll turn back to the bed and say, Our dear sheriff is asking for assistance. Is this related to the blood hunt? Yes. Very good. And I will get out of bed and start looking for wherever my clothes ended up. I am taking at least a minute to do absolutely nothing. I'm going to enjoy every stitch of time I get in this piece of fabric. The sheriff can wait. As long as you don't tell her that. Right. Uh, but but after I, oh, the due time is spent, I, I too get dressed and prepare to take Katerina back to the bakery. Are you dropping Katerina off at the bakery before going on your hunt? I don't expect her to desire any um, involvement in the hunt. It doesn't seem like something that she would be interested in, but I also think that it would be a bad form, right? Uh, to not at least let her attend should she so want to. Well, then maybe you should ask. Right. I'm saying that to the storyteller. So uh, I, after we are properly dressed, or at least somewhat properly dressed, I'll say, Katerina, do you have any interest in resolving this blood hunt issue with a more personal touch? Yes. Then there are problems within one's own clan. There is a certain amount of punishment that must be dealt out. I want to go. Very well. In a dress or not? I'll just look down on my dress and like rip up the side so that I uh, can walk more freely. Nice long slit. Totally fine. I have plenty of outfits. Fair enough. Then we're climbing in the car and heading for the pier. 
All right, so you drive down to Pier 39. It doesn't take as long as you were expecting it to, since you don't have to drop Katarina off as you were thinking you were going to have to do. But uh, you park uh, at the Pier 39 parking lot. There's no one parked there at night. So you can quite easily find a space. And you see Esmeralda pacing clenching her fists unclenching them and just prowling around the parking lot it's probably a good thing there's no kine around here right now she looks like she wants to rip some heads off undoubtedly I'll uh, approach her as I would approach any agitated bruja which is carefully Marcus thanks for coming I was gonna uh, she growls I was gonna deputize you anyway if you wanted it I was hoping to have that conversation later, but I don't want this fucker getting out and her nostrils flare. No, no, we need to be done with this business. <laughs> you brought the Toreador. She has a very um, specific reason for being here. Yes, I imagine your own primogen being blood hunted isn't exactly fun, is it? No. And Esmeralda smiles, snarls at you, Katarina. Just stay out of my way. You get more flies with honey during a blood hunt. She got in my way last time, Marcus. I don't forget. Where is the target? And she gestures down the street uh, to McGowan's infinite mirror maze which is a fairly well-known landmark in San Francisco. It is a massive, massive mirror maze that is very easy to get lost in. It's full of black lights and other psychedelic sort of trippy music and, and light effects that make it very, very easy to get lost. And people have a very difficult time finding their way around when they go in. It's considered a major tourist attraction. But now it seems it's a place for a hunt. He went in there. Thought we wouldn't find him. Tried to get out, but no one would take him out of town. Couldn't get his little Sabat friends. <laughs> We're gonna get him, Marcus. And her eyes are starting to turn red. Right. Well, uh, yeah. I guess if it's a, if it's a landmark in the area, I, I probably have some idea of the building layout, at least roughly. I'm certain that they make alterations to the mirrors or to the setup inside to change the exhibit and all, but the actual physical footprint of the building is going to remain the same. Correct. So, how many how many ways in, how many ways out? So there's the, the main front door, obviously. There's also a service entrance around the back for things like turning off the power or emergency services getting in. You also know that there's two emergency services doors. Legally, there has to be one for uh, at least one fire exit every certain amount of space. Uh, in case of emergencies. So there's a, a couple fire exit doors you could probably slip in through as well. All right. Interesting. I uh, look at Esmeralda and say, which door do you want? She arches her back, throws her head backwards and inhales deeply through her nose. That one. And she points to the right hand fire exit. Hmm. Okay. I suppose I'll take the other one then. We can work a parallel pattern through the building until we find them. Oh, yes. And her eyes are alight. So, uh, given that this is a, a building on the, on the bay, near the bay anyway, I would imagine that the, any entrances are going to have material outside, right? There's going to be, um, dumpsters, there's going to be mm -hmm. things found within the city. I'm looking for uh, any crates or boxes that may have been left out or that might be in the dumpster themselves. Okay, There's absolutely 
a couple dumpsters over here in the parking lot, particularly. Uh, mm-hmm. The maze itself is a little bit further down the pier. Sure. Uh, but you can give me a luck roll, see what you find. Yeah. 1d10. 1d10. Luck. So that is an eight. Okay. So you find a decent sized crate that's just been dumped into this into this dumpster in the parking lot. It's sort of half sticking out. You can see it even from where you're standing. You don't even have to go searching for it. Excellent. Then I will appropriate a improvised weapon and with ease rip part of the box apart before I make my entrance. You rip one of the wooden slats off the side of this this crate. Looks like a crate for a local brewing company. And just rip it off effortlessly. Katarina, are you are you making any preparations? Are there any is there like a fire escape on the outside of the building? Yes, there is a fire escape on the outside. Okay, then what I'll end up doing is getting up there and using, you know, Cat's Grace because it's passive so that I can come in from above and hopefully spot him before either Bruja does. Mm-hmm. So you very agilely climb up the fire escape. Behind you, you hear Marcus ripping a wooden slat off of a crate. Just crack. Yes, I'm going to use um, index and thumb and very just methodically, almost as if I've done it times before. And I just slowly work this slat into a sharpened steak point, just like I'm peeling a banana. And I, I imagine... If you could see Marcus's face, his visage has just changed totally. Uh, he's become very, um, almost, almost frighteningly silent, and you, you probably can't hear his footsteps anymore as he finishes his his path towards uh, the door. Esmeralda can't help herself, and she lets out a small howl as she starts her hunt. And she bolts for the door. Okay. I head in. All right. So the three of you all enter from different angles. And even though this place is closed, the lights, the black lights are still active. You don't know if maybe Esmeralda turned them on, if she flipped the power switch before you got here or what. But you can see mirrors upon mirrors upon mirrors. There's glowing pink lights, blue, purple, some sort of neon rainbow light off in another side. And you are surrounded in your various angles by mirrors. And your own reflection stares back at you. Hungry. Fantastic. Um... Well, I'd like to do my best to uh, stay as quiet as possible. I'm going to let Esmeralda do all the loud work and hopefully catch uh, my quarry while they're reacting to Esmeralda's work. So you crouch, Marcus, in this angled section where two mirrors come together and form Mm -hmm. a V. So your reflection is extending past you to all of these mirrors beyond but you're not moving. And you hear Esmeralda doing what she does best, which is causing a riot and making some noise. No one calls on Esmeralda when they need stealth. You hear her on the other side of this maze and you hear her, come on out, little traitor. It's not going to end well for you no matter what, but maybe I'll make it easy on you if you just pop out right now. Maybe I'll just rip your head off right away instead of ripping every single joint off your motherfucking body. You hear a crash. Katarina, you hear this too. So I am wondering if I have an easier time spotting him given that I'm looking from above rather than surrounded by mirrors. 
The issue with that is the way the the lights, the black lights, and some of these mirrors are angled because they have created this maze in such a way that even like super tall people, for example, wouldn't necessarily be able to find their ways more easily. So you do have a bit of a clearer idea of where things are, but it's not necessarily easier to see a person hiding in all of these mirrors and nooks and crannies, if that makes sense because you've got the lights reflecting off of all of the mirrors. You've got different mirrors at different angles. And now you've got Esmeralda's voice echoing around the entire fucking maze as she snarls. How easy is it for me to see movement? Mm -hmm. Like, even if I can't spot a specific person, how easy Mm -hmm. is it to see movement? It is easier to notice movement you'll still catch reflections, so it'll be a little bit hard hard still to pinpoint where the movement is coming from, but you can get the general idea of where things are. Okay, well then I would like to, you know, kind of pause and take a good look around. Um, so I'd like a roll from you, Katarina. I'd like wits plus awareness. Esmeralda's going to be making that roll as well. Oh, that's fantastic. So I have four successes with three tens. So you have a messy critical, Katarina, which means that you're going to succeed in noticing movement, sudden movement in an area near where you hear Esmeralda shouting, but the beast is going to come out somehow. So I'd like you to describe for me how the beast is aroused at this moment. There's a low growl that emerges from my throat. Mostly because I know that this is a member of my clan that has actively betrayed too many individuals at this point. And as far as I'm concerned, this hunt is mine. So you are becoming obsessively focused on this. And you have marked Claudio as your prey. He is your prey. And so you feel this sort of rage building up inside of you. You've only felt this really once before, Katarina. The one time but you can feel it tearing away at your insides as your nostrils flare and you catch the this, this slight hint of fear. And then you notice it. You see Esmeralda's off on the other side of the hall. You can hear the noise and a few glass shattering sounds. And then just off to the right, you catch a glimpse, just a glimpse of movement. Something darts from one tunnel to another one tunnel of mirrors oh yeah no I'm chasing that Katarina pounces Marcus how did you do on your roll I have two but yeah no 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 tens but two okay so with two from where you are you notice Katarina above you move You can see her moving away from you Mm -hmm. and away from Esmeralda towards the back. Okay. Yeah, I'll follow. And you hear Esmeralda off on the side. She did really well on her roll. Her nostrils... You can hear that deep sort of... "Ah, Gotcha. And she begins crashing through the maze. You hear a lot of swearing as she turns in the wrong place and bumps into the occasional mirror. And she doesn't seem too thrilled at the moment. A lot of swearing. But she is moving in the same direction, Katarina, and you are now. Bull in a china shop. Or Bruja in a mirror maze, but yes. Right. Yeah, no, uh, I'm happy for them to flush out. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna continue to I don't think that I move any faster or slower than Katarina. Mm -hmm. So, especially if uh, she's got a good bead on the target. 
So Katarina, you've had to dive down into the maze itself because where you are doesn't go all the way around from the top of this fire escape. It does not go all the way around. So you have to climb down or jump down with your cat's grace into the maze. So all three of you who are hunting, as you're catching the scent of your prey, just this slight tang of fear, I would like you all to roll me a d10. I have a mechanic for how we're getting through this maze. The other thing that I would like to do, if possible, Mm -hmm. is use silence of death, which makes it so that I don't make any noise when I'm walking around. Absolutely. You can definitely do that. Makes sense for you. I have a six on that roll. I have a nine on that roll. Okay. Esmeralda got a seven. Okay, so... Uh, Marcus, you make a left-hand turn and you find yourself surrounded by yourself. Okay. And it's turning kind of bluish green in here, giving you a very unhealthy tint to your already undead skin. But you've got eight or nine Marcuses all staring back at you as you run into this dead end. Katarina, uh, as you are silently moving through this mirror maze now that you have dropped down into it, you can hear Esmeralda prowling. You can hear Marcus moving somewhere. He's not swearing and cursing and breaking things like Esmeralda is, but he still makes noise, right? And so you move around in the opposite direction from where Marcus is heading to avoid him. And you see another glimmer of movement up ahead. Something moves down a hallway. Just just a flash of fabric. Yeah, I'm gonna dart down that way. Okay. You head down this hall of mirrors. One side of the hallway is distorting your image, stretching you out, making you look taller and taller. And the other side is squeezing you down. And it it becomes a little bit disorientating even for you because the bright lights of, of these of these black lights and the colors and just all of these mirrors and seeing yourself and every time you move, your reflection moves with you and you so it's really difficult to focus on where you're going because you're constantly with your heightened senses picking up movement, movement, movement before you and behind you to the side. And, and so it's very disorientating for you, but you feel like you're on the right track. And farther off to your left, you hear a shatter of glass and a loud fuck from Esmeralda. And I'm going to roll for your prey here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Katarina... As you're trying to navigate this section of the maze and getting a little bit overwhelmed and confused, just a little bit, by all of the flickering of movement from the mirrors around you, you hear a, it doesn't have to be like this. Let me out, Katarina. Let me out. We are the same clan. Let me go. Katil, you know I can't do that. Why not? And it just sort of echoes around this this hallway where you are. You can't quite pinpoint it. I would like to use entrancement on him. Okay, what does that do? So basically, it gives me an unnatural allure uh, to make them fascinated with me um, or falling head over heels or like they've met like one of their idols. And it's a... I roll charisma and presence while the target rolls what's composure. And if I win, then they're, you know, entranced by me. Okay. So we'll roll as you hear the whispering. And uh, Marcus, if you can give me a roll to see if you pick up on Certainly. on the sound at least, or perhaps some of the words that are being said. Um, so from Marcus, I would like, again, wits and awareness. All right. That's three. So with three successes, you definitely hear a voice and it sounds like Claudio and it's it's that direction. So you can turn yourself around out of this little cul-de-sac of mirrors and start heading in the right direction again. That seems fair. I'll uh, I'll do so. 
Okay, Katarina, with your entrancement. I have... Meanwhile, you hear the raging bull on the other mm-hmm. side. Come out, Claudio. I'm gonna get ya. You can't hide forever, you fucking Toreador. So that gives me six success, six successes, three of which are tens. Okay. He got eight, and he had two tens on his. He's older than you, and he is a more powerful vampire than you. He's the primogen, or he was, right? Yeah. So he is not entranced by you. Uh, he just he just sort of laughs a little bit. I thought we were friends. And you're going to feel a claw across the back of your neck as a hand tightens around your back. Let me out. Show me where the exit is. And I won't snap your neck. Claudio, I do not know where the exit is. I came in from the roof. So, Marcus, you hear the voice say, show me where the exit is or I will break your neck. So let me ask you something. Yes? Does the glass go all the way in the interior of the space? It goes high enough, right, to defeat people who are super tall, right? Yes. How far from the top of the mirrors and the layover lay here is the ceiling? You'd estimate there's maybe three and a half, four feet. Cool. Um, so I'm going to make a rouse check and I'm going to utilize uh, uncanny grip. Okay. That's a six on my rouse check. I'm okay there. Um, and so until the end of the scene, uh, I will be using potence to cling to the ceiling. So I'm going to leap into the air with strength and athletics. And I'm going to attach myself to the ceiling girders and be able to move just essentially like an orangutan if I want to all along to basically defeat the distance between and be able to see down, right? And and thusly use the light, be in a dark spot and use the light of where it's happening at as a method of finding them. Okay. So you successfully rouse your blood and give me that strength and athletics roll. So that's 10 plus the three tens I have. Um, I'm going to get one more. I have one more die to roll. Okay. So it's just 10. It's 10 successes with, with uh, three tens. Okay. So messy critical. Oh yes. So how is, how is the beast coming out as you, well, <laughs> I, I feed like an alley cat, right? I feed like like a predator. And so going into predator mode uh, to seek out a, a real live target, one I haven't really seen in, you know, 20 or so years, uh, I'm, I probably finally get really excited. And so what I'll do is I'll swing along the girders here until I can see them clutch together. And then using uncanny grip, I'm going to put my, I'm going to just for the, uh, just for a moment, I'm going to release from the Lisa girders by my hand and I'm going to push off them with potence down onto him. I'm going to leap directly at him like a, a death from above. Excellent. So Katarina, you have this claw around the back of your neck and you feel this other hand on the small of your back. And Claudio is threatening to break your neck, essentially, if you don't lead him out. What do you do? I already told him I don't know the way out. It's honest. I don't know the way out. Okay. Then maybe your little friends can show me if they want to keep you in one piece. And as he says that, Wild Marcus appears from above, and you you don't see this. You just hear a snarl and a thud as Marcus leaps down onto Claudio. So how would you like it? Because <laughs> I'm totally fine with uh, dexterity brawl. Dexterity and brawl works for me. 
And he is going to oppose. Yeah, he should. <laughs> so, Katarina, you suddenly feel this grip on your neck release slightly. He's, he's not digging his fingernails into your throat anymore. But you can feel him whipping you around as if to act, act as a vampire sh- meat shield. Yeah, so he's a coward too. I'm spending willpower. Okay. So you see him clinging onto Katarina, crouching, holding her in front of him with this massive claw. His hand looks like a claw now, not like the refined manicured hand you saw before. He is clinging onto her neck and he is holding him, holding her in front of him. Okay, so my plan would be, because Katarina, luckily, is short, uh, my plan is to go for the head. And with seven successes, my plan is to drive my fist directly into his skull. Okay. Uh, He did not do as well as you did. So, Katarina, you feel yourself being whipped around. And you, wide-eyed, just for a moment, you see Marcus and his eyes are burning red. And you see this massive fist go over your head and go into Claudio's skull with a sickening crunch. Does Claudio collapse to the ground? He staggers. Okay. He lets go of you. He staggers back. And you hear a crash of glass. And a wild Esmeralda appears behind him. And Claudio just sort of staggers. He's holding his hands up to his face. He's clawing at his chest with one hand. hes He doesn't seem to quite realize something's wrong. And then he starts to fall down to his knees. Uh, I'm going to look at Esmeralda as she's, you know, smashed through the glass. And I am going to... I'm going to attempt something really difficult. Um, I'm going to try manipulation and persuasion. This is going to be really tough for me. But I'm also going to use my status as an elder, um, which I have from Mm -hmm. the sector. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, wait. To the sheriff. You bet. Okay, give me that roll. I mean, you got willpower, you might as well use it, right? Which I'm going to do, because I have some, but not enough. Yeah? I mean, I've got five successes and a ten. Okay, she did not do super well. Not as well as you did. Does she pause for a moment? She pauses for a split second, and turning to look at you as if she can't believe that you've just said that to her. I reach my right hand back, and I pass Katarina the stake. Katarina, you have a stake now. Yeah, I'm going to drive it into his neck. So Katarina drives the stake through Claudio with every every bit of force in her tiny body. And you see Claudio's, what remains of his eyes just kind of go wide. And he coughs and chokes and slides down to the ground. And as he slides down to the ground... I follow with my teeth bared and I drink him completely dry. Marcus, you see Katarina diablerize Claudia Ricci. She drains this vampire. It's it's a blood hunt. And so you know, the rules are a little different. And so Katarina, as you drain Claudio dry, you see Esmeralda, cock her head and look at you with maybe a glimmer of respect. Not bad, but the head's mine. And that is where we will leave this session. So thank you all again for joining us. Thanks again to our wonderful players tonight. And uh, hope we will see you again in San Francisco next time. Thank you and good night. <laughs>